Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I am your host, JP John Paz. With me today, very special guest, former WWE referee, current Impact Wrestling referee. He is the son, of course, of Earl Hebner, known as Baby Hebner. He is Mr. Brian Hebner. Brian, welcome to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? I'm doing well, man. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Um, I'm ready to dig in and do what you do. Nice. What have you been up to? What's going on in your world? Um... Just busy, man, doing, um, you know, my own podcast, busy doing uh, Impact Wrestling and uh, busy being a dad. So with the combination of all of it together, busy, busy, busy. Of course, Refin, one, two, three. How's the uh, podcast world treating you? It's doing okay, man. It's doing well. Um, you know, we just uh, did our first episode uh, last uh, Wednesday. We have another one coming out this Wednesday, which would be our second. Uh, so pretty excited about that. And uh, me and RJ are working hard. and. Uh, you know, hoping everybody enjoys what they're hearing and seeing. What do you think about getting into the podcasting world? Well, I, 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 it's something I've been always been wanting to do. And um, it's just taken me a while to finally just say, OK, hey, let's let's dive in. Let's do it. Um, because, you know, the podcasting world is very big and broad right now. And uh, a lot of folks are doing it. And uh, I'm just trying to make this a little different than most podcasts, you know, giving you that third man in the ring kind of thing. And um, just trying to make it different, putting a little twist on it and just showing people how it is and what we, what I do and what referees do to prepare and what they go through and just kind of just a different perspective and make it more entertaining as best I can on my end. When initially, like, you know, you start the podcast and stuff, what's your, your vision for you want to just talk about your career and, and your life, or you want to kind of relive some moments as well? Well, right now, I think uh, what we're trying to do is just establish the podcast itself and um, get uh, that third man in the ring interaction to with with people to understand what it was like to be with some of the big stars that um, had moments and matches and things like that, kind of like a background. And then maybe evolve into my career and then maybe evolve into who knows, you know, but right now we're just trying to cover the bases of the a, a person for that episode and what it's like to work with them and then the you know the backstage stuff i went through before one of their biggest matches that i was part of that kind of thing and uh leading up to the day of and how i felt about it and how they felt about it so just that kind of thing and that's what we're focusing on and doing right now um how it evolves into what it may go after that i you know i, I don't know I like the first episode I heard with the Stinger about Sting. It was very interesting. I didn't even realize you were the ref of the uh, Jeff Hardy match. So that was very interesting stuff to kind of get the behind the scenes of that. Yeah, it was uh, it, it was a, a really tricky moment to be in. Um, not one I'm most proudest of, but I mean, you know, hey, things happen. Um, it is what it is. And I think that we all dealt with it as professionals. And so I thought a little insight from my view, you know, because I know that it's been talked about on many podcasts, you know, I, I know it has but it hasn't been talked through from the third man in the ring. And so I thought it would be a very interesting thing for people to hear and experience, you know, through their, 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 their visions and just to see what it was like for me um, and all the wrestlers that were involved and, and, and some of, you know, like uh, EB that was involved and things of that nature. So I think, you know, I think me and RG did a really good job of covering the, 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 the you know, the, the, the night um, and the day leading up to that night. So, you know, and that's what we're trying to do is just get, you know, Dig in, go back story wise, and just start from there, and let everybody know how it was. It's pretty unique to like have that happen, just that situation, because you hardly ever see something like that. You know, the big star, you don't know if he's quite with it or or he's going to make it, and you and Sting seem pretty calm about it. But it's like, okay, we'll deal with it. But I mean, that's got to be a situation that never normally happens. No, no, no never. Uh, that 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 would be the first, yeah, which is which is crazy for somebody who's been in the business as long as I have, but. Uh, that was the first on that kind of stage as far as, you know, being a pay-per-view main event. Um, you just have to just go with the punches and do the best we can. So, and that's what we did. And I know it didn't come out the way people wanted it to come out or, you know, I don't know. It just, it, 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 it was what it was, you know, at that point. Yep. Obviously Jeff was in a bad place then he's in a better place now for sure. Oh yes. Yeah. And, he, and he's a good guy. None of the stuff I ever talk about was meant to be, uh, disparaging to him or anything like that. I mean, he's a great guy, and and I feel like this was the wake up spot in his life, you know, for him to maybe get himself together and, and turn his life around. And um, I'm I'm just 
very, very happy and humble for him and, and just terrible feeling for him because I know this is nothing he'd ever want to do intentionally. You know what I mean? This is just yeah. not the way he's the way he's built and the way he is. So once again, I just want to say, you know, I, I, it's never nothing bad I'm saying. And, you know, I was just right. telling the truth. And that's what my podcast is all about is the truth. And, um, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, you got to get that story out there. The, uh, the, you know, that's the, third, the third story for sure. Yeah, that's great. With Sting and that whole situation is going on, he seemed like oddly calm. Like, oh, we can handle it. We can, like, is that how he is normally? He's just like uh, cool hand Luke? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've never seen him, and I've done many matches with him. I've never seen him freak out of a, out of a situation. Um, he didn't out of this one either. Um, he actually did try to, you know, to continue on to see what we could get out of Jeff at that point in time, just to see if we could put something together for a main event pay-per-view for a world championship match. So, I mean, I, hats off to him. He tried. Um, I tried. We, 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 me and him were communicating back and forth, back and forth, and just, you know, we just realized that at some point it just wasn't going to happen. You know, it just wasn't going to happen. And it was a savior for everybody, for me, for Sting, and, and even Jeff, you know, because you don't, you can't work under those unsafe conditions. When that happens, I didn't even realize. I like, guess you didn't know Bischoff was going to ha- come down, right? Like that was like kind of a an ad lib on his part, right? It wasn't planned. No, that was, yeah, that was a definitely impromptu. Um, and no, I, I, I think that that was just a matter of, hey, I need to buy some time. I need to figure out what's going on. I need to figure out where Jeff's at. I need to figure out where you guys are at. I need to figure out what we can get out of this kind of thing. And um, I, I mean, I would just say another hats off. And I don't know how many I give off, but anyway, another hats off to um, EB Eric Bischoff. Uh, just handled it so professionally and it was so calm. And I don't know if you ever went back and watched it or you saw it live or whatever, but I mean, he was not like stressed out and freaking out. I mean, he was very calm um, in his role, the way his character was. And I just thought it was a phenomenal job and we bought some time. Um, so that, that, that helped a lot. I remember watching it live too. I went back and watched it too, but I remember watching it live and being like, something, something is off here, but you couldn't tell. Cause it almost seemed like a wrestling storyline. Oh, Bischoff is coming in to do some sort of swerve. And, but then you saw sting when he walked out, how mad he was like, oh, maybe that wasn't like you, you almost got a sense that it was a, a work, but then you're like, no, that was definitely real. You know, that was, that was crazy. No, it was definitely real. It was yeah. <laughs> trust me. Yeah, it was oh, definitely yeah. real. There was no work <laughs> about that at all. Yeah. But as a fan, when you first watching, you're like, wow, what is going on? Like you're almost confused. Like what the hell sure, is going I get on it. out there? Yeah. When you originally got into wrestling, just to kind of rewind back, obviously the, the son of Earl, when you originally got into the business, was it always destined to be in the business? Did your dad want you to be in the business? Like, how did that go? Or was like, you're in the business no matter what? Well, no, it was, um, for me, it was, I wanted to be in the business, but I wanted to be a wrestler. Hmm. Um, but, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a really big guy or anything. You know, I'm just an average normal guy, which average normal guys can do it. So I'm not saying to anybody out there, if you want to be a wrestler, don't do it. I, I just, you know, I was a smaller guy and thought that could be something I could do. And then, um, of course, my my dad taught me into, and I don't know if he, I should say the word taught me into, but just showed me what it was like to do what he did. And I found that really interesting as well. Plus, I got to be beat up some, and I like that too. I was just, you know, and as odd as that sounds, you know, just taking bumps and stuff like that was really something I really wanted to do. And I realized that my calling was a referee as it, as the years kept going and I stuck with what I wanted to do and boom, there it was. What did he say? Like, as you're getting into the business, like, this is great. Like he's happy for you. He's, he's all for it. Um, at one point he wasn't sure, you know what I mean? Like, I think he always deeply wanted me to be in it, but I think that he wanted to make sure that I was taken care of as far as financially, if this was the way to go, you know, if this was the thing to do. But no, I think that uh, ultimately this is what he wanted, you know, for for me. Um, and, you know, it's what I wanted for myself. You know, that, that's the thing. My, my biggest fight back was my mom, who um, was never big into wrestling or anything like that. Um, but obviously she's a huge fan of me. And so it worked out with that, too. When you go back to like 88, when your your dad really and, and your uncle are reffing that match with Hogan and Andre, do you get anything like at school? Does anybody mention it to you at school? Like your dad is the evil twin, you know, the evil oh, yeah. twin referee that screwed the Hulk. Do you get, the, get that a lot at school? I did. I did. Um, Cause it was obviously very known, you know, who my yeah. dad was when I was in school. Um, I would just say it was a, it was a rough day uh, <laughs> on that Monday. <laughs> 
<clears throat> I mean, Hulk Hogan got screwed. I mean, that's that was everybody's hero. Yeah. Um, I mean, nobody threatened to beat me up or anything like that. Uh, and I don't recall that. But I remember, you know, catching a little bit of grief. Uh, but you know what? That's 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 good. That means that they sold the story. And, you know, I I didn't know what was gonna happen. You know, he just called me and told me to watch, you know, Uncle Dave I mean, is what I was yeah. told. Yeah. Um, and so I just happened to watch, you know, Sunday night main event or Saturday night main event. So excuse me. And um I did, and all of a sudden I, I just noticed something different, you know, about the referee in there, which was my dad. And I just thought David had lost some weight. You know, something looked different, you know, and I know them apart easily, obviously, because, you know, I grew up with them. Uh, but, you know, and then as things went around, I was like flipping out, like, holy crap, are you kidding me right now? So it was pretty cool for me, too. I think he wanted me to enjoy it. I don't think he wanted me to, you know, to know, right. uh, which sometimes is really cool. And he's he's done that for a lot of things throughout, you know, his career for me. He's never iggy me on things, which he wanted me to be surprised because I'm, I'm a huge wrestling fan. I was a huge wrestling fan all my life. Uh, my place was the place to go growing up for pay-per-views. I mean, I did the whole deal. You know, I had every, everybody over. It was food. It was ready to go. You know, pay-per-views, Monday Night Raw, all that stuff. So, you know, so it, it was really, really kind of nostalgic for me. Like, it was just really, really cool to see my dad and my uncle back, you know, together. And uh, after all these years, because, you know, David was in the WWF at the time. And my dad was in the NWA. Um and then have, seeing them come together was really awesome. And the way they did it was like, oh, wow, you know, shock factor. And it looked like uh, maybe possible shoulder injury for your dad as the Hulkster launched him <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> way was. over over the mark. You know, he, he yep. launched him. And that's just nothing more than just uh, your adrenaline and yeah. him being what it was, you know, just a big moment for, for everybody in that ring that was that night. Uh, but, he, yeah, my dad had to get uh, shoulder surgery following that. 33 million, I believe the number is of people that watch that, that show. So it, it was a uh, pretty popular, you know, Hulkster and Andre back then. So just sure. amazing to have your, your, your dad kind of be a part of that history too. And, and Hogan's promo afterwards is great. Cause he doesn't say they're twins. He says, it's like, you know, they replicated uh, Dave, you know what I mean? It just right. great stuff all the way around. Yeah. Yeah. When, really cool. you, when you are a fan though, you, you know, you said you're having the party. Who's your guy. Are you a Hogan guy or what were you a fan of as a kid? Uh, I was a huge, I mean, it sounds crazy now, but I was a huge uh, Wahoo McDaniel fan. I was a huge um, Magnum TA fan. Um, another huge Nikita Koloff fan. Um, and, and, of course, Ric Flair. So you're a you're Virginia guy, NWA guy. Obviously, your dad worked for the NWA. So you're, you're more of an NWA fan going back. I was. Huge. When you are growing up, are you going to the shows too? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There was a guy, his name was uh, Pat and I can't remember his last name. And that's terrible of me, but um, he was a cameraman and uh, he had a camera case that he would sit front row and he would put it right by his chair and I would sit on that camera case. So I would be front row. I mean, right there by the barricade um, and just every event I was at, that's where I sat. So it was, it was pretty cool. I was front row and center every show. That's awesome. Do you run into my buddy Eddie Cheslock at all? The old, uh, the old camera guy. Um, I haven't ran into him in a while, um, but I know who you're talking about. Um, great dude. Uh, but no, I have not run into him recently. He used to take all those pictures behind, you know, backstage of of, of the show and the guys and sure. stuff. Yeah. So he's got some great, great pictures. It's crazy. Like there's that brick wall, that infamous wall where like Flair and Arn and all those guys take those pictures. Really good, really good yep. stuff. Did yep, you really cool? You by any chance see that Wahoo's got a new book out? I did not. I did not know. What's it called? Literally just called Wahoo by John Cosper. Okay. I did not know that. Yeah, I guess his his wife and, and John, I guess, put it together, but it was I haven't read it yet, but it looks just super interesting because they talk about his whole career, his whole life, AFL and obviously his, his legendary run as a wrestler. Right. No, he was he was something too, man. I mean, uh, I never worked with him, obviously, because I'm not a you know you know, I just never did. Yeah, uh, he was pretty much done with the business by the time I got in the business. But um, I was just a huge fan of him. Um, I don't know why. I don't know what led me as a kid to do that. But I mean, I just, I just was. I was into it. Um, I just remember those big feuds that him and Roddy Piper used to have um, would drive me to tears. Like when I was a kid, it just, uh, just the, the the storytelling those two did was just amazing. And um, I was wrapped in it. Wrapped in it. Is it the style you like? Maybe the the more like. Uh 
not stiff, but like guys are snug or, you know, it just seems like they're in like a legit fight. Is it maybe that's more your, your style? Like that Wahoo, Johnny Valentine, Greg Valentine style? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I've gotten more accustomed to the way wrestling is now because that's what I have to be. Um, and, but I am like a big, uh, like you said, snug fight, storytelling, uh, working the crowd, uh, just making sure everyone's involved because you're like, what's, what's next. And then, you know, I like a couple sets of heat, you know, and I like, you know, a couple comebacks, mini comebacks. I just like that stuff. It's just old storytelling. Um, it's kind of a lost art for, for the most part. There's some that do still do this. Uh, but it, it's just, uh, yeah, I think I, I I like it. I like the theatrical part of that part of it. Why do you think that it is a lost art? Because that's so true. So many guys say that. Why is that? It doesn't make sense. It was working so well. Like, wh- why did why did the wrestling lose that? I just think fans, man, are just demanding, and that they they want to see the craziest stuff. Like, you know, somebody jumping off a balcony, they're happy, happy whether he lives or not. I don't think they really care. Just want to see the spot. You know what I mean? And, I think that part makes all the other guys do the different things because they know what makes the crowd pop. Um, and sometimes it can be boring in a setting, depending on the building and the place you're at to do what I like. You know what I mean? It, it can be because they're expecting flying and luchadoring and all this other stuff. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't think it's a lost art. I just think it's just not done anymore. I think people can do it. They just choose not to. It's weird. Like when did that, kind of stop you know what i mean because it it, for so long the storytelling was such a big part of the matches i like i can't even kind of pinpoint it It just stopped all of a sudden and it just kind of went in a different direction do you can you think like when that like the the shift happened it it just seems like all of a sudden boom changed honestly and my and i don't really know this to be factual obviously i don't think anybody does really i mean i think everybody has their own opinion i would really think that it was when the wcw introduced their um I don't know what they call it, cruiserweight. Yep. Okay. Um, and then when it was bought, and then you had Ray Mysterio and all those guys come in, I think they completely changed the way people looked at wrestling, which is not a bad thing because that's what those guys do. It's awesome. I mean, don't get me wrong. I, some of the best matches I've done was was with people everywhere. You know what I mean? And that it was cool. It was cool to ref. It was cool to sit back and watch again. Uh, but I just think that. To me, that cruiserweight division that they did in WCW kind of what changed it. You know, changed the way wrestling was looked at. Because uh, WWE and w, or WWF at the time, they weren't certainly doing anything like that. No, they uh, tried to, I guess, attempt that light heavyweight division, but it didn't really work out. But yeah, it feels like all of a sudden after that, so many different guys, even the heavyweight guys, were kind of going into that different style. You know, flying around and stuff. You know, it wasn't, wasn't the old school knockout drag out they were almost all going to that that kind of um not no psychology but like that just kind of throw caution the wind style right yep i agree when you are like coming up and coming into the business and you're becoming a referee does your dad train you or is it somebody else no my dad 100 percent trained me and uh monitored me uh the whole entire time and he felt like I wasn't ready when I felt like I was, which was interesting. But um, now looking back, you know, I agree with a lot of what he did. Um, and I think he did it to protect me from other people thinking that I had a spot because I was Earl Hebner's son, if that makes any sense. Yep. Some nepotism. You He wanted to avoid that. Yes. When you are being trained and you become a referee, what is kind of just – the importance of the referee because i feel like that's lost people can maybe don't know understand or i know the third man in the ring but just kind of explain like the importance of a ref well i mean if you're if you're a good or decent referee you should in my opinion know a match and not just a finish um you should know the match you should have a good cadence when you're when you're counting so that you know <clears throat> and the guys that you work with can learn and understand the way your cadence is and what I mean, I'm not talking about on a double down, a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm talking about a one, two, kick out, or a one, two, three. Um, and I'm also talking about communication. You need to learn how to communicate and know how to do it the way it's supposed to be done. Um, there's just it's it's very very in depth that people don't understand because 
I've seen situations where there's been companies that didn't have really good referees and you could tell and people complained, you know what I mean? And that's just, you know, it, it, it's a very, very important part. And if you ask anybody that's a, a good solid wrestler or someone that's been to the top or near the top or some of them at that, at the bottom that just rely on their referee or thank the referee because they're, they got, guided them through. So there's just so many aspects of what we do. And I'm not saying that it's more important than the guys. No, but I think it's just as important to have a good match with a referee. That's as good with the talent. It seems like that is definitely, and we're talking about like lost art. For some reason, some promotions, like not to mention names or anything, but it's like, this seems like it wasn't as important and that some referees are being like noticed. Shouldn't referees not be noticed? Isn't that like the kind of thing, like you don't want to know who the referee is the match necessarily? I would say you don't want to know who the mat, the referee is, but I think that you shouldn't want to know who the guy is right when the match starts. <laughs> I mean, like, hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, should if 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 I got through a match and they didn't realize I refereed it, that's cool. I have no problem with that. But yeah, you're you're right. I mean, you want to be small, but you want to be big inside that ring with the guys. And so, to me, the props I always wanted to get was not from people that are talking about me on the internet or talking about me in the crowd. What I want is when I go backstage and those guys say, "Thank you so much. You did a hell of a job. Uh, really appreciate you out there." Yada yada yada. That that's my appreciation. That's when I'm like happy ready to go, know what I did, what I did, and I'm good with it. Talk to Mike Kyoto and Jimmy Corderas, and they would always say Pat Patterson. Not like a joke, but almost like a little sarcastic thing, like, I didn't even notice you were the referee of that match. Like, almost giving them a compliment, like saying, right. like, you, right? Like, I guess that's a way of saying, like, good job. Right, it is. It's a, You know, you, you did your job, you get you handled the, your cues, you handled everything. Didn't even know you were in there. You know, the, yeah, of course, Pat was Pat was the best, man. Give us a good uh, Pat Patterson story if you if you have one. Um, I, I don't really have like a story, a certain story. I just have like lots of things that me and him dealt with. But like, he had such a uh, a confidence level in me that sometimes it scared me because I was always scared to disappoint. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. he just felt like I was just a really good referee and just knew that when I was in there, everything would be taken care of. And it actually added pressure to me. And I know he didn't mean to. He was just giving me confidence. He's just saying, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about you. I know you're gonna take care of things. Please go banana and you'll be fine. And da, 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 you know. And it, it put pressure on me, but you know what? It helped me though. It, it helped me to step up my game and it helped me be a better referee, focus harder, you know. And I just think that that guy just had it and knew it because he was a you know former referee as well. So you know, he gets it. He understood it. And he understood what we were going through. And I just remember when, um, you know, Brock Lesnar and uh, Kurt Angle had that uh, Iron Man match that was on SmackDown, I believe. I could be wrong. It was like seven segments or something like that. Yeah. Um, I had to remember seven different finishes. And I was just nervous, as you can all imagine. And I got lost, to be honest with you, a little bit in, in there. And, and had to ask, like, twice, I think. And then they asked me too on certain ones. It was just like, cause it was so much, you know, yep. and when you're getting beat up and banged around and, you know, and, and so much time goes by, I mean, it, it gets confusing, but he reassured me before I went out, you're going to get this, you're going to get this. Da, 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 da. And, you know, I got it, but you know, I, I did need a little hand. I'm not going to lie. I needed a little hand just like we all did. We were all leaning on each other because it was just such a, not a normal thing. It was not a normal thing for, for, our TV program. I don't think it's ever been done before since. I don't think, I don't know. You may know that, but for any show never went seven segments. You know what I mean? We had one match, I think after that, and maybe an in ring and that was it. That was the show. So I, you know, I was honored to do it. It was awesome to do, but I just think that Pat, he was the agent for it. And he just had all this confidence in the world for me. And then I, I really appreciated it. And um, like I said, I think he helped, give that confidence and that push to me as I was, as I was younger to be a better ref, you know, and that, that was cool. Do they give you instructions like in the, in the earpiece because there's so much going on? Like how do they communicate with you as far as, or are you communicating with Lesnar and angle as far as like the, all the finishes and that? Matter? Oh no, no, we're not, we're, we're not a drive through like they'd have now in some of these promotions. I don't have a callback button. Um, oh, this, was okay. this just, this was just the only thing they give me in my ears, my cues, uh, you know, to commercial or whatever it may be and count down to that and all that kind of thing. But no, I could never feed anything back to them. So our communication was with the guys, me and the guys, that's, that's how we got things done. 
man, that does seem like a lot because you know normally it's one, one finish you got to remember, and, and, and that's it. Like seven, you're like, oh my god, where was it? The angle slam, you know right? <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like, if yeah, you think five, about how many false yeah. finishes there were with the angle slam, and then finally it was the angle slam. You know what I mean? And yep, it just it was it was nuts. It was nuts. But I mean, like I said, it, it, like it was just different, and it was something newer, you know, and. It, you know, best two out of three falls is fine. That ain't no problem with me. You know, but but seven finishes, you know, is tough. Yeah, that's crazy. I remember not that long ago on Raw, I guess Randy Orton was getting pinned by um, one of the Street Profits. I think it was Montez Ford. But he kind of got, he stuck him a little bit in the shoulder. And I think he got a little bit of a stinger. And he was supposed to almost turn, I guess, and maybe put his foot on the rope. But the ref had to count three. In that situation, you got to act like it's real, right? You just get, just count the three, even if Orton's supposed to put his foot on the rope. He just didn't. You got to go through with the finish, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's times where I, I don't get nervous for myself, but I get nervous for the guys where they'll go, well, I think where he's going to put me, you know, I'm going to put my foot on the rope here, so just be aware of that. And I'm always thinking to myself, man, if you don't put your foot on the rope, you know, I've got to count you, you know what I mean? And, and that that's that's a tough spot for a referee to be in. I mean, we, did, we had something not long ago um, on our show, where poor Daniel Spencer, uh, I don't know if y'all know him or not, but he's one of our referees, and he uh, did the uh, Motor City Machine Guns versus the um, Bullet Club. And uh, there was a spot in that match where it didn't go right. Uh, it was supposed to be a, a false finish with a save. Well, the save didn't get there quite time enough, and the guy relied on that save to happen to not kick out, and Daniel counted three. And everybody was not everybody, but people, some people were stirred up mad at him and they went back and looked and the save wasn't there in time. And he laid there long enough and it was a one, two, three. It was close. It was one of those deals where you could, you could maybe work something, but you know, that's a tough spot to be in. You know, it's a tough spot to be in. Um, so that's when you're relying on talent and you're relying on people knowing their jobs and what they're doing and that kind of thing. But so much crap happens in there, man. And people don't understand that sometimes if I'm supposed to make a save, let's just say I'm one of the workers and, and I just took a bump and I'm selling or whatever, and maybe took a little bit more than what I thought. All of a sudden I could forget, oh shoot, that's that's there's the there's the moment I gotta make that save. And then that may be what happened. I don't know. And it just was a little late. And that's what caused Daniel to have to count one, two, three. So felt rough for him, but I'm glad that he was kind of in the right. Uh, but there was things he could have done, which I'm you know, working with him and learning with him and things like that, which he's doing excellent. See, I think that stuff like that is okay. But then I saw something on AEW. The girl's undefeated, and she's getting pinned. And this other girl is pinning her, and it's she must have had a brain fart. She forgot to kick out. The ref goes one, two, and, and like like it, she like wouldn't put her arm down. And then the girl kicked out, and then she like raised her arm. So I don't know. It's one of those things where it's like, man, I know the girl's undefeated. You don't want her to lose, but the ref looks so bad because you could tell she. She just wouldn't count three, even though the girl doesn't kick out. How did they even explain that on TV? Oh man, uh, not good. Jim Ross, I think. I think it was Jim Ross. It had to have been. It was just like I don't know what happened there. Like he was confused. Like kind of a I th- oh he he literally I think he goes brain fart by Jade, like saying like the girl had a brain fart. He's like brain fart there. Wow or something like it was. It looked really bad. It was. It was. A, yeah. But it made the ref look bad because she didn't know what to do because if she counts her out, the girl's undefeated streak is over. There goes the gimmick. But, right. Um, I understand. It, she's in, in a tough spot. But I was just thinking, I was like, man, that's got to be tough for the referee because you almost like have to think two seconds span. Do I count three? Do I not? Like, you know what I mean? It's right, got to right, be right. tough on, on you guys. Sure, it does. I mean, you know, I I, I didn't see that. Um, I actually would like to see it. Hmm. Uh, but, I, you know, I, you know, I, I have to see it. I can't I can't say yeah. anything about it. Because I have to see it. What you say may not be what I see. Right. You know? Okay. I, I don't know. So I don't want to. I don't want to comment on it um, because I don't know. But I would like to see it. I would like to see that. You gotta check that out. Uh, I'll uh, I'll send it to you. It it was just like crazy. It's like wow, what the hell just happened there? But uh, right. I, I feel like sometimes the referee. You know, I don't. Know, I remember Nick Patrick used to have the thing where he he would go under the guy's shoulder, and he and he give them like little like. You know, like yeah, yeah, like not the finish. Like, I guess some referees have their own thing. Like you said, I guess they have their own cadence. They have their own way of handling it. I I love Nick Patrick, but I I, I did not like that. I, I mean, I did not like that. Um, 
and it's that, that everybody accepted it for many, many years. So it's okay. So I'm not, I'm just saying me personally, my style, I don't like that. I, I just, I, if you can't kick out, I'm just going to count to three. I mean, that's just what it is. I'm not going to save you every time. I'm not going to be a savior for you every time. Right. You know, I mean, I, I just didn't like that style. I love Nick Patrick and I love the style. It's not, not like that. I'm just saying, but that, that sort of thing you're talking about, I know exactly what you're talking about. I just yep. did not like it. We had slide his uh, right arm or hand underneath the shoulder and he would count yep. and then he would, Sometimes you could even visually see him raise the shoulder. Yeah. I, I did not like that. That's just me, though. But I love you, Nick Patrick. Oh, me too. To, to each their own, I guess, right? As yeah, far exactly. as referee. Do you just have to kind of develop your your own own way of doing things? I mean, everybody has their own niche. Everybody has their own thing they do. Um, I created a style of my own that I kind of put a combination of things together the way I work. Uh, plus... You know, I was very, very much more athletic when I started. So obviously that part of it is probably not as there as much. But, um, you know, you just have your style. You do your certain things that you do. And it's really all you could do. I mean, you know, refereeing probably, you know, because if you watch MMA or anything else, I mean, everybody's different. You know what I mean? Right. Everybody does things different. Um but yeah, you just have to find that little niche for yourself, you know, and I, I, I teach and tell people that all the time when they're, you know, coming to a seminar or something like that. You don't have to do things like me. I really don't want you to do things exactly like me because then you're going to try and be like me. I mean, you can emulate and do things a certain way from the way I do things. But I mean, you don't want to be just like somebody else. You want to have your own niche, just like a wrestler. You know, you're going to have your own thing. It's not as important or not as important. I'm not going to be, you know, lying to you and saying that, but, uh, having your own niche and what you do is, is a good thing. Do you remember the first match you ever refereed? Uh, you mean like ever in the history yeah. of my, I, I don't, I don't, I know that's crazy. I, I, I'm just not that guy. I'm not that historic that holds on the stuff all the time. Um, I don't, I don't really know the first match I ever did. I would love to know. Uh, Cause I don't know. It's hard to find like referees because they don't keep stats. You know they keep stats of all the wrestlers. But sure, they do. The referees, yeah. it's it's hard to uh, to track. What about WB? Do you remember your first WB match? Um, I remember it being with the Hardy Boys and Too Cool. Wow. Um, and also remember working with Kurt and a bunch of his. Um, but like my first ever, you talking about TV or just in general? Just in general, I was just kind of curious. Oh, just in general. Um, I don't really know because they're not in the business anymore. Uh, so this was about as dark as it could dark be, um, meaning match wise. I, I don't really remember. I don't really, I, and I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be so vague with your question. I just don't want to not tell you the, the truth. Yeah, yeah, I got you. With, I just don't really know. With WB, when you get in, is that your dad helping you get in? Like, how do you actually get the WB job? Well, the thing was, before I became full-time with WWE, I was doing part-time stuff with them. Um, so the East Coast. Um, and as I kept working and doing my thing, Jack Lanza uh, really came to where he liked my abilities and liked my style in the ring and really thought I was, like, really thought I could be really good. And he pitched it one day in the meeting as far as my dad told me. Uh, my dad had nothing to do with it. <clears throat> Don't get me wrong, my dad would get me booked on the shows or, you know, would say, hey, my son can drive to this if y'all want to use him, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but I would just do that. And then Jack Lanza pitched it one day to the, to the uh, in a meeting and said that, you know, Hebner, Hebner's boy, Brian, he's been working, da, 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 da. And I think he can be a hell of a referee if you guys want to give him a shot. And so um, that's, that's pretty much the history. That's how it worked. Young, obviously, at, and it's like you said, athletic. You, you know, you, you could do the job. Obviously, very good. When you get into WB and, and you become a referee, is that like pressure pack situation? You know, Jack Lanza is recommending you of all people, huge name. You know, tippy top of the top of the scale. There's a lot of pressure on you. Um, to a degree, yeah, to a degree, but it wasn't unsurmountable. It was just, uh, it was just pressure. That uh, it was more about me living up to to my dad and not being a letdown. You know what I mean? Like, yep. oh gosh, okay, he 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 sucks. He's only here because his dad, you know that kind of thing. I never, my 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 goal as a referee was never to be, oh, that's Brian Hebner, that's Earl Hebner's son. It, it, 
you know, my goal wanted to be, that's Brian Hebner. Oh yeah. He, he's Earl's son. You know what right. I mean? Not, yep. Oh, that's Earl Hebner's son, Brian. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, I want to build my own legacy. You know, I want to do it on my own. And, and obviously I'm going to get that anyway, because my dad is who he is. He's a, he's a hall of famer. He should be a WWE hall of famer. Um, but I just wanted to have my own legacy as well. Does that bother you at all that he's not in the WWE Hall of Fame? Because that, that again came up this year because, you know, Undertaker loves him and all these guys love him. And they're saying, oh, Earl and, and even Dave, obviously, my God, he should be in too. But does that bother you at all or does that bother him at all? Like, he should be in the Hall of Fame. I don't know if it bothers him as much as it bothers me, to be honest with you. And if he does, he probably hides it. I mean, I, I just think it's bullshit. I mean, I do. I think it's bullshit. I don't know if I can cuss on your show. I'm sorry. Sure. Go for it. Yeah. Um, I just, I, I do. I think it's horseshit. It's bullshit. Um, the man did anything and everything that a referee could ever possibly do in this sport. Um, if they have whatever anybody wants to say, it doesn't matter. They put people in there that had buried that company. Um, they put people in there that could give two craps about that company. Um, he cared about that company and he did everything he was asked to do in that company. Um, if somebody could tell me why he shouldn't be, I would like to hear that because I can't, I, I can't understand it otherwise. I just don't, I don't get it. I think it's a crock of shit. Um, I do. And I don't know who's in charge of it. And if, if it, because of the supposed or what everybody thinks, the, the t-shirt, the gimmick that he sold or whatever it was, mm -hmm. horse shit, whatever. So because he did that, that takes away everything else he ever did. It's the hall of fame that you honor and respect what they did in their career. Not what they did wrong in their career because it wasn't even had, had nothing to do with in ring. That's about in ring is what I was told. That's what a Hall of Fame is supposed to be about. That's what every Hall of Fame in the world's about. That's sports wise, not about. Well, he might have done steroids. Well, we didn't prove it, but guess what? He's in the Hall of Fame. So what? He did what he did on the field. He did what he did in the ring. So I don't. I I, I just think it's a crock of bullshit. I think it's stupid. I think it's dumb for them to not honor two of the most legendary referees that have ever been in that sport. And I just think it's stupid. And I think it's petty. And as you can tell, I'm, I'm not going to get really angry, but it bothers me. And I'm, I'm, I think it's just stupid. Especially after he went to bat and did the Montreal screw job. You think like, you know, you have some loyalty there for, for life for him. You know, he went to bat, you know, for the whole Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels survivor series 97 situation in Montreal screw job. Right? Yes, exactly. I mean, he didn't come up with that. He didn't just make that up. That wasn't something that he just said, oh, you know what? What the hell? Let's just do this tonight on his own. I mean, and it, that was a very, very, very big moment for wrestling. Um, and to not honor, not just him, but him and my uncle both. I mean, not, not you know, they don't have to go in together, but I mean, that would be awesome as well. But you can't just, you know, put your toys down and, and put, them in a, put them away and just say, okay, they, they earned it. They deserve it. You can't do that. I just, I just don't understand it. And I'm not saying that they're the only referees that should be inducted either. But I'm just going to say, I mean, if you don't put them two in, who you else are you going to put in? Because if you put somebody else in, I think that they didn't do what he did. They didn't do what they did together. You know, it's just me. And I, I guess maybe some people say, well, that's your dad, not your uncle. Yeah, I know it is. But once again, you tell me why they shouldn't be. Right. Definitely. Do you think referees belong in the Hall of Fame just in general? Do you think that they should start putting referees in? Why not? I mean, we're just as important to the to the not buying tickets and putting asses in seats, but we are just as important as putting a match together that you remember as a kid or you remember as an adult or you remember in live, live, live events. I mean, is it something that should happen every year or anything like that? No, you need to earn it and be in the business for a while and, and really earn the respect of the boys and respect the, you know, the office that, that you know, respect you. And yeah, sure. If you're good enough and you've done it good enough and your legacy shows, why not? Why, why, why can't a referee do it? That's true. Yeah, I agree. With Hall of Fame, though, and we're talking about the Hall of Fame, what about Undertaker going in? What are your thoughts of like working with Undertaker? And obviously, you probably ref many of his matches. Well, well I mean, if anybody deserves it or should get it, I mean, my God, that guy. Um, so happy for him. Uh, I think it's going to be a great, great moment for him. I know he'll be very excited about it. Um, interesting, you know, as me and RJ talked, uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he does it. You know what I mean? Like, you know, character wise, uh, I know he's going to come out of character. He's going to have to, he's going to have to talk, but, uh, right. 
how he gets to this podium. Um, he might just, you know, I have my own vision, but who knows? Uh, you know, I'm just a mark for Mark. <laughs> uh, so it's going to be cool. He, I guess, just had a recent interview. He was saying he's very nervous. I was surprised to read that. I'm like, wow, he doesn't strike me as the, the, the nervous type. But I guess this is something he's not used to. Well, I don't think he's nervous. I, well, from what I'm hearing from some other people is that he's he's nervous about Vince inducting him. Hmm. I don't think he's nervous about the whole situation. I think he's just nervous about Vince inducting him. Which, you know, because Vince, you know, you, you never know what Vince can do or what would do. You know what I mean? I don't right. think he's going to embarrass him or anything. I think he's just, you know, he's probably going to do exactly what he's supposed to do. I mean, it is, you know, The Undertaker. Um, but he might be nervous about it, too, because this is a big moment for him. I mean, and also not only that, but you have to remember, this is pretty much him saying, I'm not going to get back in the ring. Yeah. For and sure. that's hard to do. What do you think about just working with him, though? Everyone always says, you know, the locker room leader. He he's very much, you know, like very steady guy. He didn't very even keel. What do you think about working with him? It was an honor and a privilege. It was uh, some of the best times of my life. Um, I learned a lot as a referee through him. Um, I just can't describe what an honor it was. Uh, it's 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 up there. I mean, he was just what he is. He's phenomenal as far as just a person, a backstage guy, in-ring performer, just everything. Just he had it all, and it's it's going to be hard to to duplicate that ever again. Do they have like certain referees like that specifically work with certain guys? Because it seems like sometimes that's the case. Like some referees will will work with certain guys. Is that the referee's call, the wrestler's call, Vince's call? Like who's making the call of like referees working with certain guys? Um, some guys prefer certain guys, referees. They do. Um, that's happened a lot throughout my career. Um, and it's, you know, it's just that they feel comfortable with them and they, they, they know that they can depend on them. And it's, it's not a knock on the other referees. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't want to dive into that because that's something I'm going to dive into my own, <laughs> by, yep, the way, yes, by the way. Yep, yes. But uh, <laughs> it's just that, it, it, yes, that does happen. It, it, and it, it happens quite often to be quite, you know, honest, it just depends on the uh, level you're at with the level of the talent. I mean, really, to be honest with you, and it's no knock on the other referees. It's just, it's just a matter of the, the confidence and the um, what's it called when the chemistry that you have with those people and they just feel good about it. And it's something like they just, it, it's, it's kind of like if you were going down the road and you were, really going to struggle with this ride because the fact that the amount of time it takes you there and you have a buddy of yours and you've done it with year for years, you want that guy beside you. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like that, you know, it's just kind of like that. Or you're going to a fight in a bar, you know, and you got your big boy and he's one of your buddy buddies and you have several other buddies that really goes to you, but you have this one that can just, you know, do his thing and you, you feel confident because you really want to go to this bar to meet this chick. And you, you're going to take him. You're going to ask him to be your guy. You know what I mean? Yep. So it's kind of like that. It's almost like the home run derby when they have like their own pitcher. And then all of a sudden they bring in somebody and it's like that guy. You're like, who's this guy? It's like that's yeah. their guy that throws him the perfect pitch that he can hit the most home runs in the home run derby. Because you'll see exactly. like Bryce Harper, like who the hell is this? And like he brings his dad or something. It's like, what the hell? But the, the, the <laughs> chemistry, he knows the right where to pitch and he, yep. he hits him the best. Yeah. There you go. That's a great yeah. Great analogy right there. Do you have some favorite guys from WB that you liked? Obviously, Undertaker is one of them. Is there guys that stand out more than others? I mean, I loved a lot of the guys. I mean, so it's not fair to just call out. But, I mean, I had some some of my, my favorite guys that, you know, that I was really close with were uh, um, The Big Show, um, Brock Lesnar, Undertaker, obviously Kurt Angle. Um, uh, at the time, Eddie Guerrero and myself. Um, you know, th those are the main ones. Don't, and I hate leaving out people, but I mean, because there, there, there were so many of them, so many of them. And, um, me and Jimmy Corderas and Tony Chimmel were really close. Um, I had a lot of good friends there, a lot of good friends there. So it's, it's just really hard for me to just, I could keep going, you know what I mean? Yep. <laughs> so there's, there's a lot of guys. I mean, Billy Kidman, um, you know, just, just a bunch of people, you know, that we were, we did a lot of card playing in my days back in WWE and um, and we had card people and then we all became very, very close. Um, so it kind of went like that in a way. And then, you know, you kind of 
build a relationship with people you work with in the ring too, as well, because you're doing it so much and so often. So, you know, those are just to touch on some. When you get released, is that, was that the whole situation with your dad and your uncle? Was that the same time? Were you still there when they were gone? No, I was still there when they were gone. Oh, you were, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. Um, to me, it, it is what it is. I knew it right. was as a matter of time, you know, because of the situation yep. that supposedly was there. Um, I, I wasn't surprised, uh, you know, and I just knew it was a moment when it was going to happen, you know, and it, it's fine. I mean, it is what it is. Hindsight's twenty twenty, And to be honest with you, it's worked out better for me. So you're liking the impact. Well, obviously TNA first, but uh, impact wrestling, this new regime, are you loving it? I do. I do. I, I really do. Um, there, there is, it is a lot different. It's, um, it, it's better. It, it's more structured. It's just a, a good place to be. And I'm, I'm very, very happy and blessed to be there. And obviously uh, Scott Demore is in charge. Is there like a big responsibility? Are you like the, the head ref or, or like you said, you were helping Daniel Spencer and stuff. Are you the, the, the king of the refs, if you will? Well, I'm not the king of the refs, but I, I am, <laughs> I am the, the lead referee. I would say head I don't referee, know yeah. if they use C senior or anything like that, but um, yes, I am, you know, I'm in charge of uh, ref assignments and things like that. And they would come to me with questions and things like that. Just like my dad used to do just same, same type thing. So yeah, that, that, that's what I am there. Yeah. I was curious about that. Like, so you're the head ref, you have more responsibilities. You're the one that, that tells which guys work in which match. Yes. Yeah. So How I make you... the, I get, a, I get a lineup of the matches and then I go through and I, um, assign the referees. Oh, okay. So how do you, is it just by like, you're picking this to somebody work with you do, or you just have a feel for it? No, I just have a feel where the guys are at and what their, their abilities are. Um, and then sometimes it, it really is about spacing on the show. I mean, sometimes it has nothing to do with whoever. It's just about spacing so we're not back to back and things like that. Um, but generally, you know, it's 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 more about spacing. To be honest with you, when we're doing tapings, because we're doing two or three at a time, so it's about spacing guys to where we're not back to back, because that's a very very important thing. And Scott was big on that when I came in about not having referees work back to back, because it just looks terrible on TV, which it does. And sometimes you have to be careful because our format is not exactly the way it goes. So you have to be careful of looking at segments and things like that. And that's something I have to go through and look at and look through. Um, and then there's some matches where it is like, you know, Hey, this guy has worked with this guy and let me put him in there because he's been doing a good job with them. And they had good feedback from me from them and all that kind of thing. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of thought process that goes into it. It's not just slapping a name down most of the times. Sometimes it is though. I'm not gonna lie, but it's, you know, Generally, I have a thought process that that works, hopefully, for for, for all of us. Um, obviously, if they have a problem or a complaint or something like that, I guess they would come to me. Can you believe, like, you're in that role just from where you started to where – I know you've been doing it for 20 years, but it's like, you know, you're not old, but it's like you're such a veteran. Can you believe, like, you're in that spot, almost like your dad's old spot? Um, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what became surreal to me was that when I was in TNA um, – I had that same spot and my dad was working with me, which wow. was crazy. Wow. So he relinquished it to me and said, you know, you're the young buck, you know, what's going on. You know what I do, which is basically nothing. <laughs> <laughs> um, give me the girls and I'm happy. And you know, that kind of thing. And my dad did some good stuff too. So I'm not knocking him about that. I'm just saying, but he, you know, I had to cut back, you know, what he was doing because, you know, he couldn't work five, six times like I was doing and um, Stipper were doing and that kind of thing. Um, so he just turned it over to me and he said, look, you know what to do, let's, you know, let's, let's do what you do. And, uh, that, that's the way it's going to be. And so that's when it was really surreal to me was that like, basically my dad was working for me, like kind of thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I mean, don't get me wrong. If he didn't like what I gave him, he'd go, I ain't doing this. I ain't doing this shit. No, I ain't doing it. You know what I mean? Yep. So then I would change it and that's fine. But I mean, but otherwise, you know, he, he let me take control and, you know, and everybody there knew that I was the head referee there. So it was, it was pretty cool. That's when I knew it was like, wow, okay, all right, I'm starting to get, starting to move forward, you know what I mean, kind of thing. But that's good. It's like a lot of responsibility, but it shows you like, okay, we have a lot of trust in this guy. He's the right. head ref. He's making a lot of decisions around here. Well, you have to understand, too, my, my dad was not easy on me um, at all, ever. At some point, I really thought that 
he was too hard on me. You know what I mean? So he really, really made me earn and respect, you know, to, to be able to get in the ring and be who, with whoever I'm with and say, okay, you're with them because you've earned it. You know, that kind of thing. I mean, I was on Sunday night heat forever. It seemed like, you know, he wouldn't, he would not put me on the show. And I kept asking why. And he would just say, you're not good enough. You're not good enough. That kind of thing. And he would, I never had a perfect match for him for such a long time um, where I'd feel like I did good. And he would just say, nope, you didn't do good. You got something wrong with your legs? And I'm like, no. He goes, well, why are you holding on to the rope? Why you got to get up using the rope? And I was like, I don't know. It was just right there. He's like, well, don't do that. You know, that kind of stuff. And then finally, I, you know, I did. And then to go from there to me and him working together and I'm in charge of the referees was just like, kind of like, whoa, all right, well, here we go. And here we are, you know, kind of thing. Got on real, you know, but that's the way it worked. It's almost good that he was hard on you because then, it, you know, you got you, you know, chiseled or whatever, got, got you ready for, for that spot, it seemed like. No, for sure, for sure. It was definitely the right way. I just, at that time, did not think right. it was. You know what I mean? It right. was like, yeah. no, I'm ready to go. Cut me loose. Let me, you know, freaking go. Um, it just, but now I understand. And I understand. And you know what? If he would have done it the way I wanted to do it, how, how many people would really have respect for me? Even though my work could have been just as good as it is now. Who knows? I don't know that. But maybe all that stuff I didn't get to do that I wanted to do helped me get better as a referee as I went years before I got to do TV. You see what I'm saying? Yep. yep. Um, so I respect it. I mean, I do. I respect that now. It does seem like, you know, when you're younger, it's like, oh, man, why, why am I going through this? But then when you get older, it, you almost look back like, man, that was great for me. That was smart. You're almost not smart enough to realize it. But when you get older, you get wiser and you're like, man, that was a great lesson. Right. No, you're exactly right. So, you're exactly right. Like with you now, I'm always curious, like, so the refs, like for you, for instance, are you guys in charge of the, the truck and the ring and, and like that stuff too? Like, do you guys have to do that? end of it uh i'm i'm not um but you know the other two referees um do um help with the ring and all that stuff now once the ring is there and the, and the shows help you know or, i'm sorry are going i will help like if they want to do like a, a, a canvas change or something like that or help clean up tables that get smashed or whatever i'll help do that and kind of you know that kind of thing but generally you know i don't i don't do anything with the ring other than that kind of thing which is which is fine with me it's great um I just get confused sometimes because I don't know exactly what to do. You know what I mean? Yep. But no, the referees in all companies still have those referees you're talking about, like I used to do in WWE, where you would referee and be on ring crew, that kind of thing. And that that still exists. Yeah. I'm just, uh, I, 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 it doesn't exist for me at this point. Yeah. You're high up there. I think it was, uh, there was a story, something about Charles Robinson. Like, he like loved being a ring crew or something. I was like, wow, it's hard, hard to believe like you could love doing it. But I guess, Maybe he's you're used to it. Well, don't let Charles Robinson fool you now, because don't get me wrong. <laughs> we had stage hands, and all we did was point. Oh, was that's why he loves. Yeah, yeah. Now he'll get his hands dirty a little bit. Yeah, oh, little Charles, him. that little Charles. <laughs> yeah. He likes that extra payday. So he's smart. Mm. So you get a little extra cheddar if you're doing that. Then. Absolutely, you do. You don't do it for free. That's for sure. But no, it, there's work involved. You, you're there before everybody else. You leave after yep. everybody else. Yep. You have late nights. Then you also have to go into the ring and referee. It, don't get me wrong. I'm I'm, I'm busting Charles because I right, love him so right. much. Yep. But no, um, he always did love it. He did. He really did. He really did love it. Um, I'm not saying I didn't. I didn't mind it at all either. Uh, the thing is, I mean, you know, I am older now, and I'm you know you know, <laughs> I'm not old, but I'm older. Um, yeah. I don't want to be at the building before everybody else. And I don't want to leave after anymore. You know what I mean? To, before, after, you know, everybody else, but you know, it's, 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 it's a good gig for, for a lot of these guys. I mean, it, it, it does make extra money for sure. So, you know, I don't think that'll ever go away because that's a way of, you know, breaking people into business as well. So what did you think of just randomly just thinking about WB guys and stuff? What do you think about Triple H's retirement? No longer wrestling. Did you have any sort of relationship with Triple H or any any sort of stories with H? I mean, he's always been a great guy to me. Always. He um actually took up for me with uh problem I had with Jericho um coming into the business for a little bit. Um he came to my bat and stood up for me. Um but what what's weird to me is that he hasn't wrestled since when? It's a couple of years, yeah. <laughs> so I think 2019, I think was his last official match. I think. Okay, so three years almost. Yeah. 
So I don't understand the big shock moment there. I don't understand the shock value there. I mean, it's it's unfortunate he's not because I mean he's a great talent. I mean he's a great draw. I mean don't get me wrong. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm just saying I don't understand the big deal of him saying that now when he hasn't wrestled in almost three years. Because I wasn't was anybody waiting for him to wrestle again right now at this point? Because I mean he's booked in no stories. Um, I get I, to me I guess it was more about his health and his health scare. Right. And then it was just a reassurance, a reassurance of. I'm not going to referee anymore. I mean, oh, sorry, I'm not going to wrestle anymore. I guess was the was the big deal. Yeah, I thought that was funny too because I was looking. I was like, when the hell was his last match? Because I knew he had some sort of street fight a couple years ago, but it wasn't really a match. He just came out and, like brawled with Orton. But I was like, wait, when the hell? And then he, it was like uh, a Saudi show in like 2019 against Orton. So I was like, wow, he hasn't wrestled in a while. Like. I didn't even like think about him wrestling. It was like you said, it was almost funny that he said, I'm not wrestling. I was like, I didn't even think about it. And like, I, was, I, I thought he had retired already. Yeah. Well, to me, I thought, I'll be honest with you, I kept seeing all these tweets and things, not knowing exactly what was going on at all, and seeing all these tweets about Triple H. And I'm like, is he about to die or what's going on? Does he have some disease or something? I wasn't sure what was going on. I really was not. But I, I was wondering why all these tweets and stuff were coming out. And then I found out that that was the, that was the thing. He had said he wasn't going to wrestle again. I was like, well, I don't understand why everybody's going crazy. I said, but I guess I get it. And I do get it now. I just, I didn't at the time. I was just like, he hasn't wrestled in a while and I haven't seen him wrestle and I haven't seen to think that he was going to wrestle. So I didn't, I don't know. It was just weird to me. It was just weird. Yeah. I think it was more about the health scare he had. And then it was official that he just said, okay, yes, I'm not wrestling ever again. Yeah. He, he can't because of the heart issue. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. sure. And I, I mean, and, and I'm so glad he's okay. I mean, that's for sure. I just, you know, well, once again, I just wasn't sure about what was going on and didn't understand why it was such a big fuss at that time. But I think it was more about the health. And then I think he was posed a question when you get back in the ring. And that's when he had said that, you know what I mean? So it all makes sense now. I just didn't understand it at first. It just kind of was confusing to me. And then when I heard about it, it confused me further until I delved into it and figured out what was going on. Now, as we hit the wind down, we head towards the finish here. Do you have any regrets in the wrestling business? Maybe anything you didn't get to do or anything you wish you'd done differently? Um, That's a good one. Um, I don't think I have any regrets. But I think sometimes there's things I wish I could have done or would have done differently. Um, but that's it. I mean, in other words, decision making in the ring. Um things like that you know what i mean like because everybody's like that they go back and they watch things and they see things you do that kind of stuff but i don't think that'll ever go away you know what i mean no matter what because you're never going to see yourself as perfect i mean i know at least i'm not some people do believe me trust me they do um <laughs> but i don't and um i'm proud of matches uh but i don't i don't ever really see I, I don't ever really see a perfect match for me anymore. You know what I mean? Not, I mean, not when I say anymore, meaning like ever, I just have never seen it. I've seen really good matches and I was really proud and said, I did a good job there, but why did I do this? Why did I do that kind of thing? So I don't think there's any regrets. I mean, I, I don't live life with regrets. I just don't. What do you think is like the legacy of the Hebners yourself, obviously Dave and, and your dad, Earl, what do you think is like the, the legacy of, of you guys? Because we were kind of hinting at, you know, you want to create your own legacy, but what's the legacy of the family, you think? I, I, I'm hoping at one point in time when we're all dead and gone, and I would like for people to say the Hebners, those referees were the best ever in this business. Um, I think some people say that now about my dad and my uncle now. Um, I would like to be, because by working hard and showing my worth, uh, for somebody to say the Hebners were fabulous referees, but Brian was the best. Brian was the better of all Hebners. You know what I mean? And I got ways to go. Don't get me wrong. And I'm 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 going to strive at that. And I want that's what I want to be. And I don't want to settle for anything less. Of course, got to mention Refin One Two Three, the podcast, which is slowly but surely climbing the charts. Man, uh, you guys are kicking ass over there. So, tell us what's next in store for the podcast. Uh, yeah. So go to our podcast. It's called Refin It Up. Uh, obviously with me, Brian Hebner and, uh, RJ. And it's, uh, this week we have this Wednesday, uh, 9am is when it hits. 
we are going to touch on uh, The Undertaker. And Brock Lesnar is the theme. So it's going to be really good. I've got some really good stories. And we're, we're doing it on a week where, you know, he got announced to be into the Hall of Fame. So that kind of goes with our theme. Uh, really good listen. And um, if you want to follow us on Instagram or Twitter, it's the same thing, at Refin' It Up. And then also you can follow me if you'd like to at Baby Hebner on Twitter and on Instagram at Baby Hebner. Same thing. So not hard to figure out. Uh, so please, if you want to submit questions or anything like that to us or give us feedback on our podcast, we take constructive criticism. We take positive vibes, all that stuff. So please feel free. We're, we're a wide open podcast. We're here for y'all. And uh, we just hope you like it and can tell us what you want. Nice. I keep calling it ref and one, two, three. It's so funny. It's refing it up, but I'm saying one, two, three, because of the, the ref. <laughs> well, I mean, that's my gimmick too as yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and I keep thinking, yeah, the one, two, three, that, but that, that's great. And you guys are kicking ass and taking names. And I think everybody will enjoy that podcast. So thank you for all the time today, Brian, really appreciate it. Baby Hebner. Awesome stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it very much.